Well, good evening and welcome to the seventh night of Digital Reboot. We are so excited you're here. I see people tuning in from all over Canada and even the world as far away as New Zealand and the Philippines and India and again, all over Canada, including right here in Toronto where I'm coming to you from my living room. Guys, we have so fallen in love with you. Our team has been praying for so many of you by name. It's been incredible to receive questions from you both at the digital live events like tonight as well as some of you have availed yourself of our prayer at rzm.ca email and shared your prayer request with us and we are praying for you and we are filled with anticipation for what God has for us tonight. Tonight we're talking about the question, does God even care about my suffering? It's a, a huge question that has I've rocked a lot of us, a lot of us tuning in tonight. And so I'm so looking forward to you and I getting to hear what our speaker tonight has to say to that question. Uh, I want to let you know that next Tuesday we have my colleague, my precious friend, Logan Gates, speaking to us about the question of freedom. And then on July 3rd, which is a Friday, we're going to have another full evening of Q&A. There's no talk that night, just Q&A. It's going to be amazing. And I hope that you can not only be there, but bring your friends as well. Guys, some of you already know that on Thursday nights, we've started another series. It's the coronavirus series. And we have a whole list of the most senior voices at RZAM Global speaking to us. I know some of you were there last week tuning in. Um, I, I should highlight that it starts at 7 p.m. So it's different start time than Reboot. If you're already registered for Reboot, that's awesome. But that's not going to cut it for Thursday night. You actually have to make sure you're registered uh, for that. This week, this Thursday, we're going to have Dr. Vince Vitelli and Dr. Joe Vitelli, a power couple, speaking to us on social distancing and how that impacts relationships. We, we'd love to have you. Guys, some of you tuned in last week. Um, we are giving a gift card to two of you who tuned in. Wish we can give gift cards to everybody, but then it'd hardly even be a competition. Yeah, Jordan Bauman and Carter Carpenter, you guys tuned into the Thursday night series this past week, and you have won an Amazon gift card. And so we'll be, uh, look, check your email soon. You'll get that. Uh, the theme for tonight is the theme for every night of Digital Reboot, which is no question is off limits. So even now you can be asking your questions, please send them in. Um, at the same time, the questions that are on topic, so questions on suffering, how could God allow suffering, stuff like that, are you gonna be the most likely to be asked? I anticipate that like most nights, we're gonna have way more questions than we have time to be able to go through. We'll try as much as we can, but yeah, your, your questions on topic will most likely be asked, but uh, any question is welcome. No questions off limits, and you can all upvote questions by voting. You, you're smart, you can figure out how that works. I also wanna remind you that your safety is honestly so important to us. We don't want anything to happen to you online. So um, just want to remind you to not give away personal information. If anyone asks for personal information, we're going to remove them um, from, from these talks. So don't share personal information. Don't be asking for it. Uh, let's make sure this is a safe community online. Tonight we're talking about does God even care about my suffering? We're going to run a poll right here. Uh, so does suffering usually drive me? And then we have options closer to God, further from God. You see those uh, right there before you. So yeah, please put in your answers. Um, guys, so excited to introduce our speaker tonight. She was my professor of apologetics when I was down in Atlanta for the EAP program. And I remember just being rocked when I heard her and she was speaking about the very topic that we're looking at tonight. Incredible. She has her PhD from Oxford University. She is a brilliant mind. She's married to Dr. Vince Vitale, who we heard from here at Reboot a week previous. Um, just some random facts about her. She In the US, she finds she's British, but when she's in the US where she lives now, she tells people her name is Joe and everyone calls her Jerry. They legit think her name is Jerry and she does not like that. So I'll be sure not to call her Jerry tonight. Um, the last time that she and her husband spoke at a youth conference together, a man walked up to her husband, Vince, and said, you must be so proud that that is your daughter and her ability to speak. And Joe has never let Vince live that down because not, her, not his daughter, his wife. Um, so without any further ado, please give it up for Dr. Joe Vitale. <laughs> Thank you so much, Daniel. And uh, yeah, I really haven't let Vince live that down. The best thing about it is that Vince is, that happens to Vince's dad all the time. People, um, people think that his wife is his daughter and Vince teases him about it so much. So when it happened to him, uh, it was just amazing. Uh, but it, it is so good to be with you guys for another Reboot Digital this evening. I wish that I could see all of your faces, but unfortunately you're just gonna have to settle for seeing mine instead. I'm so sorry. Um, I don't know what your day has been like, uh, but 
if you're anything like me, you occasionally have those days where you just can't get a certain song out of your head. That's been my day and, and not even good songs. Uh, these are children's nursery rhymes that my one-year-old son loves to listen to. Now, I absolutely love him, but he has terrible taste in music, the kind of music that just gets stuck on loop in your head and it never, ever stops. Take, for example, Humpty Dumpty. I'm sure that is a nursery rhyme that is familiar to many of you. Sorry to bring it up again, but for those of you who don't know it, Humpty Dumpty is a nursery rhyme about an egg called Humpty Dumpty that is sitting on the wall and then he falls off the wall and he breaks. Admittedly, it's not an overly sophisticated plot, but you know what? As I was listening to it for about the 10 millionth time a while ago, it actually suddenly struck me that the message of Humpty Dumpty is actually quite profound. Just bear with me. I'm going to, I'm going to read it out to you again so you can be reminded. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great Fool, all of the king's horses and all of the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. The end. Now, how brutal is that? They couldn't put him back together again. And that's a story that we tell our one-year-olds. And yet at a deeper level, I think that the truth behind the story of Humpty Dumpty is striking because whether it's life that breaks us or other people who break us or whether we break ourselves at some point or another, Humpty Dumpty eventually becomes the story of every single one of us. You don't need me to convince you that the world is full of people who are hurting. Just spend 30 seconds online and you'll be overwhelmed by stories of pain and injustice. Maybe you don't even need to go online to know any of that because you've already experienced those painful realities for yourself. A couple of years ago, I was speaking at a church when after the service, I saw a girl who was about 13 years old sitting alone at the back of the church with no one else paying any attention to her. So I excused myself from a conversation and, and I went over to ask her if she was okay. But as I sat down beside her, she broke down into floods of tears and she turned to me crying and said, what do you do when your whole life is falling apart? And her words came back to me again just last year when, when Vince and I actually went to the doctors to get an ultrasound because I was 11 weeks pregnant and we were so excited to have the chance to hear our baby's heartbeat for the very first time. But as the nurse turned on the monitor and we all began to listen, we found ourselves met with this deafening silence instead. And eventually the doctor came in and with precise medical terms, let us know that the product of conception was no longer viable for life because the heart had stopped beating the week before. Now, to be honest with you, I can't really remember much else of what she said after that because her words were just drowned out by the silent screaming in my head and my heart. You Maybe the problem isn't the songs that get stuck in our heads, but maybe the real problem is that we're stuck in these songs, just like Humpty Dumpty. We've all fallen off the wall. We are lying in pieces. And as hard as we may try and they may try, nobody can put us back together again. And some of us take our anger and our outrage out into the streets and online for the world to see. Some of us just sit in the back of church and we cry. Some of us silently scream. But one way or another, whether silently or loudly, suffering causes all of us to ask the same question. Is there anybody out there who even cares about my pain? God, do I even matter to you at all? Now, according to atheism, that's a wasted question. Because if the universe is nothing more than a random product of time plus matter plus chance, then the answer to that question has to be a resounding no. And if that's correct, if if, it'll, if everything really is just matter, then the fact of the matter is you don't really matter. As much as we may like to pretend otherwise, if we're all just cosmic evolutionary accidents, then there's nothing particularly special or meaningful about your life at all. And if all you are is matter, if we're just living in a material world, then that also means that your pain doesn't really matter either because it's just the way the world is. In the words of renowned atheist Richard Dawkins, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no good, no evil, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Cry all you like, but it won't change the fact that your silent screams will go unheard, your protests will be ignored, and your tears will be unseen. 
But, you know, Christianity, on the other hand, it has a radically different story to tell. As a child, I remember being taught that every true and good story has a beginning, a middle and an end. And from the beginning to the middle to the end, the message that sounds out louder than any other in God's story is that however you may feel and whatever you're going through, you matter to God. And if you miss that memo, you actually don't have to look very far to find it because it's laid out for you right in the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible. God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Now, according to Christianity, you are not random. You are intentioned and you are no cosmic accident. You are divinely made and not just made by God, but made like God. His design is woven into your DNA. His love is imprinted on your heart. You know, as I held the body of our 10 week old baby in my hands last November, I thought about how the world would have me believe that at that stage of development, they don't even count as a real person anyway, that they're unformed, unworthy, unimportant. But as I look down at our child, one and a half inches long, curled up perfectly in the palm of my hand with their arms crossed and their tiny eyelids peacefully closed, I didn't see a product of conception as the doctor labeled this child, but I saw our child made in our image and fiercely loved. And did you know that the Bible uses that very same language to describe God's love for us as God promises his people in Isaiah 49 at a time when they are all feeling abandoned and neglected. He says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child that she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. You know, atheism says you're nothing but a product of conception, but God says you're his child. Perhaps you've been told you'll never be enough. You'll never an amount to anything. You're too small and insignificant to count. But God says he has engraved you on his hands like a mother cradling her child. He holds you to his heart. He has not forgotten you. And if you matter to God, then you better believe that your suffering matters to him as well. In fact, it's precisely because of this innate value that God has placed in each one of us that we can put words to why suffering matters so much. It matters because it is a violation of the most sacred thing in the world, a human person. And yet at the same time, if what Christianity teaches about human value is true, it also means that no matter what has happened in your life, your worth will never be defined either by anything that you've done or anything that's ever been done to you, but simply because you are made in the image of God and you are fiercely loved by him. But perhaps you're sitting here thinking, yeah, yeah, Joe, that all sounds really nice. But if it's true, prove it, because I just don't see it. All I see is darkness. Before we lost our baby, Vince and I had already decided on the name Luca. It's a name that can be given to either a boy or a girl. But in the Greek, it means light. Luca means light. And when Luca died, it, it definitely felt like a light had gone out. You know, even then in our grief, we still had evidence to hold on to that God loves us because we remembered what happened in the middle of God's story. It's been said that actions speak louder than words. And I wonder what someone would have to do to prove that they really loved you. Do they buy you dinner? Do they sit through hours of watching baseball with you, even though they don't understand the rules and they keep accidentally cheering for the wrong team? Welcome to my marriage. Do they look after you when you're sick? Do they share a bank account with you? You know, usually the more someone's willing to give up for you, the more you can be sure of their love. It would be hard to doubt someone's love for you if they willingly took a bullet for you. And in the most stunning divine response to human suffering imaginable, this is exactly what we find at the heart of the Christian faith. A while ago, I was reading the passage from C.S. Lewis's book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, and they're all on this ship that begins to approach a very dark island, this terrifying place where every dream has come true. But these are not daydreams or fantasies. These are the dreams of darkness, of every horror that the human mind can conjure up and conceive of. And terrified of facing this all-consuming blackness, the ship tries to escape, but it's pitch black and they can't see a way out. And then Lewis writes that just when the dark 
darkness could never be any thicker and the fear never stronger, Lucy cries out, Aslan, Aslan, if you ever loved us at all, send help now. And then suddenly a light shone. And as Lewis describes it, Lucy looked along the beam and presently saw something in it. At first it looked like a cross. Then it looked like an airplane. Then it looked like a kite. And at last, with the whirring of wings, it was right overhead and it was an albatross. And it circled three times round the mast and called out in a strong, sweet voice. And after that, it spread its wings, rose and began to fly slowly ahead, bearing a little to starboard, offering good guidance. But no one but Lucy knew that as it circled the mast, it had whispered to her, courage, dear heart. And the voice she felt sure was Aslan's. You know, in the hours leading up to Jesus' death, we're told that darkness covered the whole land. And how remarkable that the God of the universe, the one who lit up the night sky, would willingly step into that darkness, into the nightmare that we ourselves have made of this world, drawing close enough to whisper into our ears, courage, dear heart. And yet he can only do so because he was willing to save others by not sparing himself. Uniquely amongst all other worldviews and faiths, the Christian God knows exactly how it feels to be born under the threat of violence and terror to be the victim of racial and social discrimination and oppression, to flee for his life as a refugee, to be so overcome with anxiety and thoughts of death that in the Garden of Gethsemane, he actually sweated tears of blood and cried out that his soul was overwhelmed with sorrow, even unto death. To know what it means to be unjustly killed, crying out that he can't breathe as the authorities looked on, unmoving, even to know how, how it feels to die all alone, gasping for breath, completely socially distanced from his loved ones. If you ever wondered why Jesus' death is sometimes referred to as the passion of the Christ, it's because passion comes from a word in Greek that means to feel so strongly that it's agonizing. It means to love until it hurts. And that is exactly how God has loved us. As one author puts it, the world takes us to a silver screen on which flickering images of passion and romance play. And as we watch, the world says, this is love. But God takes us to the foot of a tree on which a naked and bloodied man hangs. And he says, this, this is love. And yet God's love doesn't stop there. During my college days, there was this popular myth floating around that when it comes to relationships, men are always trying to help women solve their problems when all women really want is a shoulder to cry on. And it was after Vince and I had been dating for a couple of months that it became clear how well he'd learned this lesson. We were walking down the street in Oxford and I was telling him at great length about a frustrating problem that was deeply troubling me. And, and at that point, Vince launched into an explanation of all the various ways that we could resolve the situation when suddenly he stopped and he turned to me and he said, Joe, is this one of those times when you want me to help you fix the problem or do you just want a hug? To which I replied, hug, please. But while Vince and I may have been a walking, talking stereotype that particular day, I think the reality is that most of the time in human relationships, what we're really hoping for is not one or the other of these responses, but both. Deep down, we don't just want somebody who will give us a hug when we've had a bad day. We want someone who is committed to making it a good day. We don't just want a shoulder to cry on. We want someone who is willing to shoulder the burden with us or even for us when we don't have the strength to bear it any longer. And it's exactly the same when it comes to God. He not only meets us in the middle of our suffering, but he also ensures that outcome at the end. When Jesus came to us in our darkness, he didn't just come to whisper courage, dear heart, but he came to pull us out of the nightmare. Earlier, I mentioned the children's nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty, as an illustration of the way that all of our lives are kind of falling apart. But the writer Alice Potter notes that actually for the Christian, there's a very important line missing from the poem. And the line is this, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. But the king could. But the king could. And the king did. And then the king cried out, it is finished. At the cross, we not only see the king of the universe with us in our suffering, but we see the king defeat our suffering once and for all, guaranteeing us hope for the future. 
justice for injustice, innocence for guilt, freedom for shame, despair for hope, the death of God exchanged for the life of humanity. We are a people who like to live in the moment. But you know, before we even know it, all of our moments will be over in the blink of an eye. The question is, is this really all there is? Is this the extent of what life has to offer us? The morning of the day that I had my miscarriage, I was at work when a friend asked if she could pray with me. And she knew that the baby wasn't expected to make it. But what she didn't know was that we had called our child Luca or the meaning and significance behind that name. And so to my astonishment, when she prayed for me, th these are the words that she said exactly. She prayed this, Joe, God has put a light in you and that light will never stop shining. And as she spoke those words, I knew to the bottom of my soul that they were true, that no matter what, Luca truly never would stop shining. Why? Because as the author of John's gospel puts it, the true light, the light that gives light to everything has come into the world. The light has shone in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. I don't know what darkness you're in this evening, but I do know this. There is no shadow that he won't light up if you'll only let him in. If your life is falling apart, if you too have found yourself praying, God, if you ever loved me at all, send help now, then know tonight that there is a God who has not forgotten you. You may feel invisible behind your screen. You may feel completely unseen and unnoticed, but you are seen tonight by the God of the universe. How could he possibly forget you. He has engraved you on the palms of his hands. He actually has the scars to prove it right there in his palms. Even in his resurrected body, the Bible still describes Jesus as carrying our scars. He wears them forever so that we won't have to. It's a reminder lest we ever forget of just how much God cares about us, even in our sufferings. And as we move into a time of q and A, I'm first just going to close by praying a few verses from a poem that was written by Edward Shillito, who was a, sh a soldier in the First World War, titled Jesus of the Scars. And if that's where you're at tonight, if you're in a place where you just know that you are hurting and you really need to know that there's a God who gets your pain, who feels your pain, who sees you, who understands tonight, then feel free just to pray those words with me now if they reflect where your heart is this evening. If we have never sought, we seek you now. Your eyes burn through the dark, our only stars. We must have sight of the thorn pricks on your brow. We must have you, O oh Jesus of the scars. The heavens frighten us. They are too calm. In all the universe, we have no place. Our wounds are hurting us. Where is the barn? Balm. Jesus, by your scars, we claim your grace. The other gods were strong, but you were weak. They rode, but you stumbled to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but you alone. Amen. Well, thank you so much for listening, everyone. We're going to go into a time of Q&A now. So I welcome Daniel back and um, he can lead us in that. Thank you so much, Joe. It's such a gift to get to spend time with you this evening listening to you speak. Um, it, when you spoke of the famous sad story of Humpty Dumpty and then <laughs> retold the story with, but the king can. And I think that's a, a resounding word over each one of us tonight that we need to hear. Well, there's a lot of questions. There are a lot of good questions. Um, we're grateful to everyone who has asked and is continuing to ask questions. Um, we're gonna start with, um, we're gonna start with one from Sadie. And this is the question. Um, when Christians are deeply hurt by someone, are they obligated to forgive this person because they're a Christian? Wow, Sadie, uh, you didn't mess around there with your question, did you? Thank you. Thank you for asking that question because it's so important because forgiveness is right at the heart of the gospel. And, and yet it's the hardest thing in the world. Sometimes it's the hardest thing to receive from God. 
And sometimes it's also the hardest thing to give, especially as you said, if if you've been deeply hurt. And I don't want to minimize that pain. You know, I, I think what's so important about the cross of Jesus Christ is that he doesn't sweep our pain under the, some divine cosmic carpet and say, hey, no big deal. <laughs> um, actually, he is committed to justice. And I think that's what we see when we look at the cross. We see the strongest and most overt statement God could ever have made that actually it's not okay the ways that we wrong and demean and abuse and violate and harm one another. And there are serious consequences for that. God is more committed to that than anybody. That's why victims of suffering can look to the cross of Jesus as the one hope to hold on to when everything else has let them down, even when human justice has failed them, which it so often does in our fallen systems, to know that there is a God, a judge of all the earth, who will do what is right. So I don't want to minimize justice. A God is more committed to that than you are. He's committed to that for every person in this world, including on your behalf. He cares about the way that you've been wronged. You know, some of you this evening, you have been really hurt. Um, and that matters to God. That truly, deeply matters to him. But I, I guess the thing I want to say about it is this, that actually um, God reminded me of this even the other day when I was feeling pretty mad about um, some things I've been seeing people doing, ways they were behaving, and I wanted to call them out on it in a big way. And sometimes that's appropriate. But but in that moment, twice that day, different people shared the Bible verse with me without knowing where my heart was. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And it, it was kind of a rebuke to me as it reminded me, Joe, I know that this frustrates you, but but you've got to leave this in my hands. You've got to trust in my justice. Um, doesn't mean we're not committed to just causes and bringing about justice on this earth. But when it comes to, to those dimensions of playing judge over other people, that's what God does. We don't get to do that. And so the, my, the second half of my response to your question would just be actually to share a parable with you. Uh, that is from Matthew uh, chapter 18. It's one that Jesus tells. It's probably the most challenging. I mean, he tells some challenging parables, but maybe this is the hardest one. Uh, it's the story of the, uh, the unforgiving servant. And it's when a servant owes a king a huge debt of money. I mean, we're talking like millions and millions of, um, well, I will say pounds because I'm British, um, but fill in your own currency. Um, and then um, and then uh, the king graciously forgives him the entire debt and lets him go free. But then the very next day, um, as he's walking along, this guy who's been forgiven this huge debt comes across someone who owes him, say, like five pounds. And then um, this person says, I'm so sorry, I can't pay the debt to you. And rather than forgiving him for the debt that that he's um, that he's owed to him, he has him thrown into prison. <laughs> And you can imagine the response of the king in that moment because he's saying, I have forgiven you all these millions of pounds and you can't forgive what this person owes to you. Now, I don't mean by saying that to trivialize the hurt that you may have been through by saying, well, maybe it's, it's not very much. But my point here is this, that whatever people have done to us, however grievous it is, what we owe to God is actually so much more. And I think it's hard for us to understand that because uh, we're seeing through our perspective, not through his. But every one of us owes the most vast debt to him. And God has forgiven us of it. And there's, it says in scripture that, that those who've been forgiven much love much. And so I think maybe the thing to do here is to ask God to help you in your heart because forgiveness is hard. It doesn't come easily. Our feelings don't change towards. Sometimes it takes it takes years of praying, waking up in the morning saying, God, I really want to forgive them, but you know my struggle here. Help me. Help me to, 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 to get to that place. I, I, I do forgive them, but help me to, to be free of the anger that sometimes accompanies that. God knows that that's hard. God knows that there is justified pain. God promises that there will ultimately be justice, but it, but we give it into his hands and we release that person. Now, there's a difference between forgiveness and just stepping immediately back into relationship. That's important too. You can forgive somebody and it doesn't mean that you're immediately going to be best mates again. As sometimes they've harmed you in a way where actually that's not even appropriate or right. Sometimes they may not even want your forgiveness or acknowledge it and if, if that they've done anything wrong. And if that's the case, you're certainly not obliged to just act like it's no big deal. But I think this is about what you owe to God, what God has given you, and therefore what we what we continually give back to him. And, and that is a lifelong journey of learning. So I really appreciate the fact that you're starting to wrestle uh, these things out now uh, because it, it takes a long time to one thing to learn it and another thing to keep walking it out. Joe, thank you so much. And Sadie, thank you so much for the question. Um, before I joined this team, I did a lot of work uh, on human fighting human trafficking and sexual abuse. And so this question of forgiveness and our 
our duty to forgive comes up a lot in that work because people have been harmed, like maybe some of us on this call tonight and, and some of those or other ways have been harmed in really profound ways. And so then we're asked, then we ask the question, like, how can we forgive? And I think that sometimes we talk about forgiveness as if it, um, as if it means understanding or as if it means um, trusting. But to forgive someone doesn't mean that we understand, like, that we get why they did what they did. Uh, for a lot of things we need to forgive people for, there's no way to rationalize or excuse or understand what they did. Absolutely not. But we are choosing to not hold on to the poison of bitterness. But instead, we can forgive them and still seek justice. And so when we're working with victims of abuse, we're able to help coach them to forgive. Um, but the, by no means does that mean we're not going to still go to law enforcement, go to the police and help press charges to make sure that justice is still served. Um, so by no means are we called uh, to, to excuse, to, to understand why people did what they did, uh, nor to trust them again. And sometimes Christians have gone ourselves in, or sometimes leaders in churches have gotten people um, hurt because uh, someone did something that was that was wrong, maybe even criminal. And as part of forgiving them, we thought we had to also just act like nothing, nothing happened. And that allowed people who have hurt people to continue hurting people. And so we want to be very clear that we are called to forgive everyone, but we're not called to necessarily trust them in that same way again. Um, and so um, that's just, yeah, we need to keep that in mind. I think that when we realize that forgiveness isn't the same as trusting someone again or giving them access to hurt us in the same way again, then we can see forgiveness isn't just a duty, but it's actually such a freeing thing because it really frees the one who's been hurt. If, if I realize that I need to forgive someone, it actually uh, frees me from, um, from still being gripped and defined by the way that I was hurt. As long as we refuse to forgive, it's as if it's our, it's our own self that is kind of gripped by what happened. But when we can forgive, we become free from that. That no longer defines us. But again, we can still seek justice. It's such a good question, and it's definitely worth us spending a lot of time on it. There's so many more questions pouring in. Um, so let's go to another great question. This is from Savannah. She asks, uh, sometimes when I'm suffering, I feel guilty because my problems are so much smaller than people who are dying for their faith or are in terrible situations. So Joe, how can I feel sadness without feeling bad? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's one that we all wrestle with as well. Um, so thank you. Thank you for asking that. And I, I think I think there's an appropriateness to your question, because on the one hand, you're right, we do need to hold these things in perspective. I remember um, going through a real struggle at, in my late teens when I, I felt like I basically had made an idol out of cosmetics in my life and an image, and I needed to give that up for Lent. I mean, it was only like, you know, a couple of months, uh, but I found it so hard. I remember bursting into tears, weeping on the floor saying, God, I'll give you anything, but don't ask me to, to let go of that. And I remember feeling so convicted uh, that other people were laying down their lives to the gospel and I couldn't give up my mascara brush because that's how how caught I was in this idol. And and sometimes we need to be reminded of that right perspective. Um, I think I, I'm about to absolutely botch uh, a quote from uh, Tim Keller, so I apologize to him if he ever finds out, but it's basically along the lines of, um, you know, humility isn't about thinking more of yourself or less of yourself. It's actually thinking more about others. And so I think it's good to have that perspective of saying, okay, this really hurts me, but yes, there is a persecuted church. And and yes, other people, the world over is suffering. I think we're in a culture that's very much about a victim mindset where everything is always about my pain, my suffering. I'm the most hurt person in the world. And it doesn't mean we're not hurt, but, but that can be dangerous for us because we get so self-involved and self-centered that we're not able to love others. And, you know, as Christians, we're called, what is the model of love that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we're called to lay down our lives for brothers and sisters. So right perspective there, Savannah. And yet... Uh, the balance to that is to say, God, God doesn't minimize your pain. He doesn't think you're small minded, you know, for, for things that that really hurt you that maybe aren't a big deal to someone else. But you, they are a big deal to you. And, and God sees, you know, how much it, it, t it takes you. I mean, I'm, I, maybe it's a slightly different analogy, but I was thinking of, um, you know, the widow's might and the widow who, you know, she only had a tiny bit of money to give, but she put it in the offering. And, and Jesus honors that gift because he knows that however much that seems like not a big deal and not a lot of money, the thing that she had to give up to her, it was everything. And some of us have real deep struggles. There are things in your life that actually have been really 
really hard and really painful for you. And it doesn't matter if that's someone else's struggle or not, because it's yours. And, and part of the beauty and the intimacy of walking with God and him knowing you that well is he knows exactly how hard something may be for you. Um, and so I, I think he cherishes that and he delights in that when when we when we invite him into our pain, when we say, actually, God, I'm not going to be fake with you. I'm not going to pretend everything's fine or just suppress my feelings. God has never asked that of you, but bring them to him, invite him into the journey, ask him to see things, uh, help you to see things as as he sees them. Um, and that will help you to have that right perspective of on the one hand, being able to, to, to walk out that pain with him. And at the same time, to to, to ask him to keep renewing your mind to see it as he does and that will give you the right perspective but you know for, for one person they're laying down their life for another person you might be laying down a relationship and and some people might say that's no big deal but you know how much that meant to you and, and what the fallout and the cost is in your life so uh, God God honors those sacrifices you know we're all called to be living sacrifices and that is a hard thing to do but but let the Lord measure it you don't need to measure it yourself or compare yourself to others. Joe, thank you so much. It's so much fun getting to hear you speak, Joe, and it's such, it's, it's, you're such a blessing. And um, we're so grateful for the question. Here's the next question. Um, this comes from Lily, and I'm going to offer a quick answer, and then, Joe, if there's anything you want to add, feel free. Um, Lily asks, why sometimes when you're stuck and you don't know how to get out of the hole that you put yourself in over and over and over again and you keep on doing the same thing and it gets frustrating because you feel like you can't get out of it and no it's just hard because you get stuck in one place and you know how you don't know how to move forward and you feel like you're suffering or you ask yourself why is he gonna let us suffer mm. Lily, that is such a good question and um, even the flow that your wording of the question is something I can so relate to. And I know so many of us can. Just as I was reading this, I was thinking of Adam and Eve. They are the first example we have of the rawness of suffering that you're speaking of. I, I find at the start of your question, you mentioned about we find ourselves in a hole that we put ourselves in kind of over and over again. And I think about how when Adam and Eve um, when they did something that they were forbidden to do, they did something toxic by disobeying God. It's, they kind of put themselves in that hole. Um, they ate of the forbidden fruit and they felt for the very first time shame. It's really interesting what they did as a response. And it's something I have done metaphorically, which is that when they then heard the sound of their most precious friend of, of God walking through the garden, one who they had walked with and enjoyed friendship with him before, they ran and they hid themselves away. They didn't just hide themselves away, they hide themselves in fig leaves. They, they put fig leaves on the most intimate and private parts of their body. There's something about fig leaves I didn't know when I first heard this story. And that's that fig leaves have a sap on them that irritate and even burn human skin. It actually harms and hurts us. In their effort to try to hide their shame and make sure no one knew that they were in a hole, that no one knew they were suffering, that no one knew they had done anything toxic and embarrassing, they actually ended up harming themselves even more. I love God's response. God doesn't um, just embarrass them. No, he, he calls them out of the shadows. He calls them out of hiding into the place of vulnerability. And as they end up confessing what happened, um, God lovingly promises redemption and rescue. And it's the first prophecy we get of the coming Messiah and Savior of the world, Jesus. But not only that, God clothes them with clothes that can actually cover their shame and not only cover them but actually not hurt them what i find so important and relevant to your question is that in order for them to put on the clothes that god gave them they had to peel off the fig leaves that they were hiding in which means they would have had to show their their naked self before god and even each other and, and with that, they would have even exposed where they now had self-harmed because the leaves would have actually harmed them in a sense. Hiding themselves was further causing toxic behavior and self-harm. And so they had to expose it all before God in order to receive God's gift of his covering and his, his restoration. And the same exact thing has been true in my life and maybe even in your life if, if we stop to really understand. And that's because often when we find ourselves in a hole, like you said, we often put ourselves in that hole. Not always. Sometimes uh, we can see how others did something to us that causes us suffering. Other times where there's a sense of emptiness or depression, anxiety, and we have no idea what's causing it. But often we are somewhat responsible for some of the, the pain in our lives, self-destructive behaviors, sin sometimes. 
And when, when we find this shame, whether it's something we've done or someone's done something to us, we tend to want to hide it. I know the first thought that goes through my head sometimes if I do something I shouldn't is I need to make sure no one knows about this. And when we act that way, it's as if we're like Adam and Eve hiding not only in the shadows, but even hiding in the fig leaves. So when we conceal the shame, brokenness, pain, or suffering in our life, we end up like fig leaves burning us. Like it causes more pain, not less. We think we're doing something that's self-preserving, but it's actually self-inflicted pain. It's as if we're digging a hole even deeper. But just as Adam and Eve step to healing and wholeness was found as they were able to peel away the leaf, step into the light, and be able to invite God into their pain and invite each other into that reality. So also when we're able to tell someone, tell God and someone what's going on in our life, our suffering, our sin, our shame, whatever it might be, we find that it's the first step to wholeness. And so I really want to encourage you that if you find that there's habits, behaviors, addictions, thought patterns, attitudes, whatever it might be, that are that like putting yourself in a hole, not to hide it anymore, but find someone that you can trust who knows the love of God and can confess it to God and to them. I think that's part of the answer to your question. Mm -hmm. the, the, the fact is that there is a lot of suffering that isn't because it's our fault. And I don't want to in any sense be victim blaming. Some of us were suffering because our parents have neglected us or treated us badly or there's bullying at school. Or there's so many things. Again, sometimes there's just suffering going on and the emptiness of uh, just like a, a darkness that we seem to be in and there's no understanding why. I don't know if I, in just another, like another 30 seconds, can answer why they're suffering, but just two thoughts to leave you with. One is that often the most kind of beautiful, most meaningful moments of our lives is found with the backdrop of suffering. I, I, I recently got married, and just before that I got engaged, and when I was looking at engagement rings, these beautiful diamond rings, you find that the way that the, the, the jewelry sellers, the jewelers uh, would display a ring is that they always have like a black background that they have the ring in front of. That's because you can see the intricacy, the beauty of the diamond against a black backdrop. It's, it's the best way to see it. And often the, the, the most, I think, exquisite growth and um, yeah, it's kind of development happens with that backdrop. Joe mentioned that they went through the, the brutal pain of losing a baby last year. My wife and Alexander and I, we, um, we experienced the same thing in early May. And it was so painful. It was suffering. Like, I don't know if I've ever suffered to, to lose our baby before we even met our baby. But I've seen that, it, that going through this darkness, that because God is, 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 is good and because he's with us in our suffering, that it actually has like, enriched my friendship and my romance and just like every dimension of my relationship with my wife and even the depth of my trust in and closeness to God. I wish that our baby was still alive today. And uh, in a sense, there's no amount of like blessedness that comes from suffering that can take that sense of loss away. And I don't fully understand why we had to suffer like we did, but so, so I don't know if I can fully answer why suffering but I can promise you that God doesn't waste any suffering. But like Romans 8, 28 promises that God can use anything for the good of those who love him. And that's what he's done in our life, even in our pain. Joe, if there's anything you want to add, I'd love to hear your thoughts. No, I mean, that that was a really excellent answer. I think, um, I think, the only thing I might want to say there is sometimes it's it's hard when you when you're stuck in these cycles because you you kind of get tired of going back to God because you feel like we're here again you know he's tired of hearing from me and so I think sometimes the reason it's hard like Dan, you know Daniel's absolutely right we need to bring these things into the light but sometimes it's hard to go there because you're like but well, I've done it before and it didn't it didn't change anything and um, I love the quote from Charles Spurgeon who's a kind of old English preacher who said um God is always more ready to forgive than than you are to um offend basically Basically, like no matter how quick you are to turn back to those ways, God is faster to forgive. So don't think he's tired of hearing from you and tired of you coming to him. And, and I wonder if it's just worth asking yourself the question, because if, if this is something, even if it's causing you suffering, you, you've said it's something that you yourself have put yourself there and that you keep going back into it. So it might just be worth asking yourself, what is is it um, about this thing, whatever the situation is, that even though you know it's hurting you, 
there's a part of you that keeps going back to it because there's something in there. There's something that you're desiring that you think you're getting from that thing that keeps putting you there, even though it's hurting you. And whatever that thing is, I think Vince talked about this when he was on on here and the other week as well, but, but there's probably a good desire in there. There's probably some kind of, whether it's for affirmation or for love or acceptance, or there's something you're getting from that thing that, that you think you can't get from God. And so it's just worth asking, what is that thing? Because there's probably a good desire that has been warped and twisted, but God, God wants to offer you the fullness of whatever that desire is. He says, maybe you think you can't have this. Maybe you can, you can have this in me. You can have this life. I've, I've, I've made you for life, the fullness, the abundance of life. Um, so, so so maybe it's worth thinking, okay, what, what is it that, that causes me to put myself there? And then believing that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead actually lives within you. And therefore, you are more than a conqueror in Christ, that actually there is power to overcome whatever this thing is that feels like it has a grip on you. Um, you don't need to stay there. As Christians, we're not meant to live in this constant spiral of, of, of guilt and shame for freedom. Christ has set us free. God has called you to freedom and he doesn't want anything less for you. So don't, don't believe the lies that tell you you're stuck in this whirlpool forever actually there is a freedom and that you have been made for you're made for more god wants more for you he's committed to, to helping you be free from that but but maybe what he needs you to do is identify what is it i'm looking for here and, and what do i need to bring to god and, and ask him to help me find in him thank you so much joe and lily thank you again for the question it's so important and we will be praying for you as you're as you continue on with this journey for help um, John asked a really serious question. They're all serious and weighty questions. And John's question is this. What do you do when you're done with life? When you just want to give up and let everything go? Yeah. John, thank you so much for asking that question here in this space this evening. I really appreciate that you've brought it. Uh, you, I don't feel like you're alone in this. I'm sure you're not the only one who has experienced that feeling or is currently experiencing it. So I do thank you um, for sharing that. Um, I think the one thing, one thing as a starting point I want to encourage you with is you're not meant to wrestle with that alone. Um, within the Christian faith, we're not called to carry our own burdens. Christ carries them, but also we're called to carry one another's burdens. And particularly with a burden this big, you shouldn't have to shoulder that alone. So I realize that that can be a really hard thing to talk about. Um, but I do really encourage you to find somebody who you can speak about this with openly, whether it's a counselor, a youth pastor, a parent, someone who can actually get alongside you and help you walk through this, um, because this is a really serious and, and weighty thing. I think, um, you know, there can be so many different things involved when we're talking about struggles with suicide and, um, and, and the pointlessness of life. Sometimes it, it has to do with, with struggles to do with mental health and depression. And if, if that's the case, just know that's not your fault. You know, sometimes it, we just have chemical imbalances in the, the brain. It can be the same as any other kind of sickness that we're struggling with. And that isn't on you, but, but that does mean that it might be appropriate to seek medical help and um, to work that through because you may find that's going to make a difference. And, um, but also sometimes we struggle with the pointlessness of life because actually, Without God, that is a right intuition. This is something uh, Vince actually talks about quite a bit. That that actually, I mean, if you really think about it, without um, without God in the picture, I do think it's pretty bleak. I was saying in the talk earlier, wasn't I? The atheistic view of the world it doesn't make you special. <laughs> like there isn't meaning and purpose to life. There, you know, we try and create our own meaning, but that is really hard to sustain. It's really hard to muster up and just build a sense of meaning out of your own life. And I think people try and they try all the time, but it's constantly collapsing because the thing that you're trying to build and construct your life out of and prop your meaning up on, they are shifting sand. They, they cannot hold and sustain the weight of what is required to make your life meaningful. Um, but that doesn't mean there's not a hope. Uh, the question is, what are you going to build your life on? And 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 there's I encourage you actually to read the whole of Ephesians chapter two. Uh, that was in my mind this evening as I was praying about this event. And I wonder if it was because it was for you, because that talks about the, you know, the ways of the world and the old mindset we have, a way of thinking about things that is dark and it's depressing and it's very hopeless. But then this this uh the verse comes in in, in uh in the English standard version, verse three, it says, but God, but God, everything's dark, everything's terrible, there's really no point to anything but God. And, 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 there are times in my life when I, you know, I felt that same struggle of what is the point of it all? So what? It all seems so 
pointless and purposeless. And no matter how hard I try, it's like a hamster wheel. I don't feel like I make any difference. I'm not achieving anything. And um, it can be easy to feel like, what is the point in it all? But I, but I come back to those words it's almost like a full stop and um, as something to anchor my life on. But God, in his in the riches of his mercy, he has given us grace and he has given us life. And, and that's what that verse goes on to talk about. And, and I just wonder if maybe the struggle here is that, you know, you feel like life is pointless because you're hearing all these voices. It's, it's impossible in our world right now not to feel like you're drowning in the voices of social media and everyone's opinions. And, 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 and it, it, it will swallow you up if, if you let it. Um, but God has something else to say to you this evening. And I wonder if the challenge here is, he's not saying, I need you to keep clasp onto your own, own life. I need you to hold on to it tight and make of it what you can and just muster up the energy and just carry on, even though everything feels pointless and difficult. Maybe God is asking you to let go, but not let go in the sense of, of giving up and suicide, but let go in the sense of surrendering. You know, that's why we took, you know, Jesus talks about whoever wants to um, gain their life, you know, uh, will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake will keep it. And maybe Jesus is saying, I, I have a new way for you to do life a way that isn't about you trying to scrape together meaning and muster it up and and just struggle through the pain by yourself alone. Um, but, but maybe Jesus actually has a different message for you. It talks in the Bible about the fact that we always carry around the death of Jesus in our bodies so that the life of Jesus might also be revealed in us. And I wonder if you you have experienced that and if you know that, if you've actually ever really said a full yes to Jesus and stepped into the fullness of life that he truly has to offer you. Now, I'm not saying that that life is always rosy and perfect and easy. It's not. Sometimes you suffer more for being a Christian rather than less. But God, <laughs> you step into relationship with the God who created you before the foundation of the world, who came to this earth in the middle to redeem you, and who promises you that however bad things seem right now, it will be over in the blink of an eye. And, and the life that he has to promise you goes on into eternity, a life where there will be no more mourning or crying or pain because the old order of things will pass away. That is a promise he makes you and a promise that he he will live out with you. Christianity isn't just about investing in that future hope and saying, well, everything is terrible now, but one day it'll be okay. So let's just, you know, only fix our eyes on what is unseen. We do that, but we do that while living in the presence of God right now, a God who's with you, a God who loves you, and a God who wants to empower you to have the life that he created you to live, a life of freedom, a life where you know joy, which goes beyond the, the ups and downs of happiness. It's a joy of knowing that you're profoundly seen and deeply loved and that you matter to him and that actually God has a purpose for your life. We talk about the pursuit of happiness. Actually, the thing that really grounds a life isn't happiness. Happiness comes and goes. Our feelings come and go. It's meaning. It's, it's knowing the one who made you for meaning and the one who gives you meaning and purpose and the one who walks that out with you. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever, whoever believes in me will live even though they die. Do you believe this? And what I would love for you to know is that resurrection life and power, not just as a, as, a, as a hypothesis or a theory or a nice fairy tale idea, but a rooted real resurrection that that raises you from the dead, you know, not just in a, in a um, long term physical resurrection sense, but right now a resurrection in your life, a coming back to life and an asking God in to give you that gift that, that only he can give you. The world doesn't have it. It can't offer it. People search for love and purpose in all the wrong places. You will not find it anywhere else, but you will find it in Jesus Christ. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I think that's a gift that he would love to offer you tonight. Joe, thank you so much. It's such a gift to hear you speak from your heart and from scripture. Um, John, I just want to throw in that one of the things that's helped me, but there's nothing to add to what Joe said, but um, one of the things that really helped me um, when I felt sometimes how you're describing is to remember that the God has made you to make a difference that that sometimes in life like this world we live in in North America on the one hand there's a sense of inner emptiness and on the other hand there's just like I don't know like so much of our lives um, are designed to be about ourselves but I found so much meaning and purpose and a refusal to just to just let go when I remember that like I have there are there are people in this world that are hurting that need you to 
to be the conduit through which they hear that but God, that people need to hear the reality of who God is through you, that there are people who are victims who need someone to fight for justice through, uh, and you're the one to fight for them. You're God's hands and feet. And there's such purpose and meaning in that, that it sometimes is like a, a fresh breath of life into my lungs to remember that you and I were made to make a difference. We're, we're created for a purpose, and there's so much meaning in that. Hey, the next question is from Abigail, and Joe, Abigail asked this question. Why does God not answer my prayers, even when I have been praying for a while and I feel abandoned by him? Mm. Yeah, Abigail, thank you so much for um, for us, for putting that out there, because I think we've all been there at different times. Um, I understand that full well, you know, when I went into the doctors and uh, there wasn't a heartbeat, um, I didn't give up. I spent two weeks praying that Jesus would would give life to our child because I knew that he's the God of miracles. I've seen him do miracles, actually, with my own eyes. So why couldn't he do a miracle in this instant? You know, I didn't want to um, want to rule that out. And I think sometimes we do the opposite thing that we we give up on praying and, and we think prayer doesn't make a difference because God's just going to do whatever he wants to do anyway. That's not the way the Bible talks about prayer. The Bible actually says um, that you don't have because you don't ask and that if, if you ask anything in my name, then I will give it to you. And I think when we don't bring our prayers to God, we're basically playing God because we're deciding for him what he does and doesn't want to do. We don't get to make those decisions. God does. I believe in the power of prayer. And yet that makes it even harder in the times when the prayer doesn't get answered and um, because because i believe that he can you know why why that miracle and not this one you know why why did that person's child get to live and, and mine didn't you know i i don't get the answers to those questions and it can be easy to feel abandoned in those moments now i know that i'm not abandoned because like i shared earlier i I, if nothing else, I can stand on the historical fact that Jesus Christ came, he lived, he died on a cross and he rose from the dead for me. And, and that is an event that changes everything in history. And, and I may not always get the answers to my questions as to why this prayer and not that one. God, why did you show up there? But you didn't show up here. And, and I remember a time when you used to answer, it felt like you answered my prayers all the time, but now it's been like five years of barrenness and I pray and you're not there. And, and you know, the, the Christian walk is like that. There are times when God feels so close and there are times when he feels really far away. And sometimes Sometimes that's on us because there are there are reasons that we put him at a distance, um, and other times it, it genuinely seems to be that God is 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 allowing us to be in this space, not where he's gone anywhere. The Holy Spirit never leaves us. God is always with us. But but he, it's almost like he He leaves us in this place of tension where we have to wrestle it out. And as, as, as part of the walk of faith is saying, you know, how much do you really want me? You know, how, how much are you in this for the stuff you get for me or for, for life, because life is comfortable? And how much are you just after my own heart? You know, anyone can um, sing songs and worship God when it feels good and you get a great high from it in, in the church service. And it's like, yeah, this is so so fun but true worship is when you don't feel like it and it's really hard and you go to him anyway because he's worth it because he is good because even though you're not seeing the evidence of it in your life you know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ conquered the grave that he died on the cross for you and therefore even when evidence doesn't look like it around you you know that there is a God who is for you now sometimes being for you doesn't always mean you get what you want I am so for my one-year-old son I give him a lot of things, <laughs> um, but there are certain things sometimes he wants um, that he doesn't know are going to be bad for him that that actually I, I have to say no to or I have to defer on and say not yet. Um, and, and he thinks it's because I'm harming him. Actually, it's because I have something better intended for him. I have his best in mind. And it's really hard when we don't have God's perspective when it comes to prayer. And because sometimes he sees things, actually most of the time he sees things <laughs> that we we don't see, that we can't see. We're not in a position to see. There are certain prayers in my life I fervently prayed for a really long time. And I was mad at God that he didn't answer them. And then years later, I look back and I'm like, God, I'm so glad that you didn't answer my prayer. I never thought I would say those words. I thought you betrayed me so badly at the time, but actually you knew what you were doing. And even if it took a while, now I see the trajectory of what you're weaving together. And, and God is is holding all the threads of this master tapestry of life. And, and we only see the smallest fraction of it, but he sees the whole. He has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. Sometimes that's going to conflict with what you think the plan and the purpose should be. And that's really hard, but he hasn't gone anywhere. He's still got you. He will never leave you or forsake you. He won't let you go. And so um, sometimes that's, that's about saying, God, this is what I really want. 
from you. This is what I'm asking for. I'm asking in your name. But if for some reason this goes against what you desire for me, because there is a better plan, then as Jesus himself prayed, um, not my will, but your will be done. And that can be the hardest prayer in the world to pray. Um, but it's also often the most powerful prayer as well. I remember when our friend Nabil Qureshi was dying of cancer a few years ago and Vince and I were really praying as soon as we heard the news that God would save him from cancer. We didn't want him to die. He was only 33, had a daughter and we just couldn't fathom that this could be a good thing. So we were crying out to the Lord and asking him, Jesus, would you save him? Um, but, you know, in that moment, we just had a sense of uh, both of us, of, of, of the Holy Spirit, maybe saying, saying to, back to us, you know, I already have. I already have saved him. And sometimes we need that eternal perspective as well, that we wanted we wanted to be healed in the now so he could go on for another few decades, but then he would still have to die. But God had already done the work. He'd brought Nabil from death to life. He had saved him. And ultimately, that's where our hope is grounded, even as we ask. And sometimes our prayers are answered immediately. Other times they're postponed. Other times God has something better in store. But keep asking and keep pressing in and, and don't run from him because you're disappointed. Keep going to God and ask him to show you what he's doing, to, to show you the path he's weaving and walk it out with him. And it may take some time, but I think you'll see that if you stick with him, he he, he is the friend who's closer than a brother. He, he will be true to you all the days of your life. He will be faithful and you will find him to be faithful. Um, but sometimes we need that little bit of perspective and that time. Thank you so much, Joe. Guys, I know some of you are like, hey, it's 831. I thought we were closing 830. There are so many good and weighty questions. We're going to keep going for a few more minutes. So stay with me. I'm going to, I'd like to, us to get through three more questions. And then there's a, a few really important announcements. So stay with us. Um, we're going to go a few more minutes and maybe be completely done sinking at 845. Uh, the next question um, I'll take, it's from Savannah. And at first, it might not sound like it has to do with suffering, but I think it might be. And I think it's important and relevant. The, her question is, is it wrong to talk to people in your head whom you control when there is no one else to talk to? Savannah, I'm not sure if this question is because of this topic today, uh, but I know that a really precious friend of mine who's a teenager themselves is someone that has been wrestling with us themselves. They've shared that with me. And in their case, I don't know about your case, in their case, it seems that it is because of suffering, that they've been through some tough stuff, and right now their reality is really painful. And so it's, it's more comforting and comfortable for them to talk with imaginary friends, kind of play make-believe, um, than it is to, um, to engage with reality. And so I... I want to, yeah, just kind of maybe um, uh, ask you to, to pause and consider what might be um, the motivation in, in being able to talk with imaginary friends and to seek to be really honest with that and to see if, um, yeah, to, to seek maybe it has to do with a, like kind of escaping some tough stuff and um, kind of it's so different than the Adam and Eve situation, but uh, just as Adam and Eve were kind of trying to run from what their context was um, and the healing was found and like stepping into reality. I think that healing and wholeness is found in, in sometimes in, in the moment it's more difficult, but in the long run, it's the place of wholeness to, to refuse to kind of run from, hide from or escape from, from the reality and to, to, to kind of engage in reality. Now, at the same time, I have um, some nieces and nephews who are much younger and they'll play make believe, and they'll have imaginary friends. I don't know if you've seen the the story, uh, the Pixar movie, uh, Inside Out, but there's this character Bing Bong, and Bing Bong is her imaginary friend that she speaks to. And then at one point, as she's growing up, Bing Bong kind of fades away. And as I've engaged myself with this question, Savannah, I started wondering at one point, like, what if God is an imaginary friend? It kind of felt the same. Like when I was a kid, I would I'd speak with imaginary friends, and as I grew up, I kind of let them like an Inside Out fade away. And I wondered maybe God is uh, someone that I. I it's a creative outlet for me, a source of make-believe comfort. But maybe as I become an adult about life, it's time to let that fade away too. But um, Joe spoke about the death and resurrection of Jesus. And we're able to examine that um, using logic and the tools of historical inquiry. And as I wrestle with, is this God really real or an imaginary friend, I found to, to really be real. And that's where I just want to land this answer, is that one of the reasons that it's good for us to to not be engaging with speaking to imaginary friends is that we have something so much better in God. 
And so I would encourage you, if you're someone who is, you're a teenager and you uh, have some imaginary friends, I would encourage you to, um, to turn attention away from that and to actually kind of channel that desire for, um, for communication and for speaking to the real, true and living God who's able to bring healing where there's brokenness. And even if you, sometimes you feel like there's nothing to pray about, maybe again, like we spoke with John, John's answer, that we're called to make a difference in the world, to invest your time and your energy in praying for the suffering of other people, to pray for healing and wholeness in this world. And to like we were made for a purpose and, and to engage with that purpose by prayer. Um, I, I hope some of that's helpful. And we'd love to follow up with you individually if, if you have any more questions about that. Uh, here's the next question. Uh, this is from Sadie. How do we share the gospel with someone who was hurt by the church without minimizing their pain, but still correcting their false beliefs about Christianity or Jesus? Joe, what do you think? Um, Sadie, I, th I think you're asking the right question because there are a lot of people who've been who've been hurt uh, by the church or, or those who've claimed to represent Jesus and they just haven't. They've said they're doing things in the name of God that God wouldn't associate with at all um and so yeah this is this is something going to come up against all the time um i think the first thing to do here is to apologize because you actually can do that because as a christian the church is your family and that means that actually you you have the right to apologize on behalf of, of them if, if the church has hurt people and i don't think you can move forwards at all until you do so i, I think that can be a really appropriate thing it shows humility um it shows that you care about them i also think uh before speaking before being quick to speak you need to ask them a lot of questions trying to understand where their pain is coming from, the extent of it, exactly what they've gone through. Don't downplay it. Don't try and sweep it under the carpet. Let them share. Let them speak. Be slow to speak. And, and you just listen. Be with them in their pain for as long as you can. Uh, partly, uh, this is often if this is what people have been through, then uh, it's going to be a long walk because you basically have a role to play of helping restore the damage that has been done and 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 you yourself they've been hurt by the church but you yourself represent the church as well and so the important thing here is that uh, you need to as daniel was talking about need to be jesus hands and feet you need to show them what what the love of jesus christ really looks like and, and sometimes that can take a while for people to receive that especially if they've been hurt they're gonna be so wound up so tight and clo closed to it um, that that may take a while, um, but that's so that's okay. This is in God's timing. You just walk that out, and then I think when you get the opportunities, when you reach the point where you've really listened, you've really walked with them, you've really loved them well, um, to then just just as much as you can steer them away from from the people that have harmed them and to the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, our friend and colleague Samuel Rhee will often say that we shouldn't judge um, Jesus by the church, we judge the church by Jesus. And uh, and I would just want to add to that, Jesus will also judge the church. Uh, he has some harsh things to say to those who claim to do things in his name. Uh, and, and to some of them we're told, he will say, get away from me, I never knew you. You know, you claim to do things in my name, but you had nothing to do with me. So I think it's good to, to let somebody know that, that actually as much as they were hurt, Jesus, Jesus thinks that's a big deal too. He is hurt by the fact that they were hurt and he has something to say about that. But keep bringing them back to him. Say, what you went through, does that reflect the character of Jesus? Maybe we could even do a Bible study together. There are some great resources uh, that you can find. There's one written by Becky Manley Pippet um, on, on the life of Jesus. Um, and check out some of her resources. I think she has one on Luke's gospel and one on John's gospel. They're just like really short studies, but really focusing in on who is Jesus Christ. And I think the more time someone spends with Jesus, the more they see the beauty of his life and, and how radically countercultural he was and the way he loved people so fiercely and relentlessly. And um, the more attractive he will be to that person. And I think they're not, you can't make this person fall back in love with the church, but you can invite them to come to know Jesus and help them to see him. And he will be the one who invites them to fall back in love with him. So, so take them to him and let Jesus do, do the persuading. Thank you so much, Joe. We're really running out of time. This, there are, I think the worst part of this job is having to choose to answer only specific questions. So um, Anna, Sarah, um, Jeevan, Ephraim, you, there's so many good questions. Uh, I just I want to invite you guys back both next Tuesday and then July 3rd. July 3rd is all Q&A. So we're going to bring some of the questions that we're going to answer today and bring them to that evening. So please keep tuning in. This is going to be the final question that comes from my boy, John Kim. Uh, he asked this, Joe. He says, why is it in the New Testament? God is kind and caring, but in the Old Testament, he's smiting and killing people. Mm. 
John, <laughs> Daniel's like, we have like no time left. And let's just unpack like the hardest, biggest question. John, thank you for asking this question. Um, I wrote my PhD in the Old Testament. So I have a lot of um, thoughts about the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament, but I didn't always. I struggled with the Old Testament. That's actually why I chose to do my PhD on it, because there were some texts that I was wrestling with. And I just thought, you know what? If God is good and, and if Jesus worships God the Father and, and, and refers to him as the God of the Old Testament and Jesus treats the Old Testament as scriptures, as true, as the word of God, I need to figure out what I make of the Old Testament because I don't think I can throw it out and just accept the Old Testament. Either it all is true or none of it is. And I don't have a middle ground here. So that was a wrestle for me. Um, I'm not going to be able to answer your question in the two minutes that we have. Um, I'll give you a resource at the end to go away and think about this more. There's, there's a slight thing I want to challenge in this, which is people often set them up as opposites. You know, God of the Old Testament is awful and evil and Jesus is like free hugs, everybody. <laughs> Actually, that's not the story you see in scripture. On the one hand, the person who talks more about judgment and hell than anyone else in the Bible is Jesus Christ. Judgment is a big theme also in the New Testament. On the other hand, in the Old Testament, we have a God who um, is prepared to judge the people of Nineveh because they've gone so far astray and, and uh, uh, behaving so badly. But when they turn and repent, um, God has mercy on them and, and he forgives them. And the prophet Jonah is so mad at God. And he says, this is why I didn't want to come to these people and, and spend time with them because I knew that you were going to do this. You were going to threaten judgment, but they would repent. And then you would show kindness and compassion. And I hate it when you do that because I want these people to be judged. <laughs> so so we, we see the mercy of God. My point is this throughout the Bible from beginning to end from the old to the new running all the way through we have two themes we have that uh, strongly represented the mercy of God and the justice of God and both of them are really really important um just I, I used to struggle with that actually I used to think if God is so loving why doesn't he just forgive everybody why why would he judge anyone you know particularly in the old testament we see examples of God judging with immediacy um and in the new testament it seems more that God is is holding it off he's giving people the opportunity to turn and repent now that Jesus has come and um, but there will be a day of judgment so one way or the other there's judgment in both these testaments the question is why why is this so important uh, you know why can't God just practice what he preaches and, and forgive everybody as, as we're told to do but actually for me the thing that changed was when one of my friends went through the terrible um, experience of, of being sexually abused and seeing the way that, that that changed her life, seeing the way it broke her, seeing um, the way she went from one damaged relationship to another because ever since that day she can't cope with intimacy. There are no words to describe how angry I was at what happened to her and how much I longed for the person who did that to her and who got away with it to receive judgment, to be held accountable for what they had done. And that's when I realized that actually that's what the heart of God is about. You know, we hear this word wrath in the Old Testament and we think of this picture of God like flying off the handle in a rage, like he's just so angry and ragey and inconsistent. That's not what wrath means. Wrath is actually God's unrelenting opposition to evil in all of its forms. God stands utterly opposed to evil because he is good. We think of love and judgment as opposites, but actually the two go hand in hand. If God didn't judge us, he'd actually be saying he doesn't really love us or care about us because he'd be saying no big deal. Whatever happens to you, whatever, I don't care. But he cares. He cares deeply. He cares more than anybody else does. And that's why judgment is so important. Uh, now, when, when it comes to the Old Testament and, you know, you're talking about smiting, killing people. Yes, you're right. Sometimes God's judgment in the Old Testament comes in the form of, uh, of, uh, of judgment that is enacted right then and there. Now, part of that is, uh, is because of the fact that, uh, you know, when we come to the Old Testament, we're just dealing with a different culture and a different time. And we need to take account of that. For example, warfare in the Old Testament. People often think of the Canaanites as one example here. Um, it, why did God behave the way he did at that point? Um, in part because uh, he's trying to actually pre prevent the way that the, the, the damage that's being done. When, it, when a culture is so far gone, sometimes there's a time and a place for preserving what you can preserve uh, and also bringing judgment at the same time. Now, we think of judgment as lashing out, God lashing out in violence with immediacy, kind of. But actually, you know, the Israelites are annoyed at him because it takes them 400 years, 400 years to, before he finally brings about judgment um, on, on this people group that have been oppressing and harming people for a really long time, including their own, including the slaughter of their own children. And so what we see is God being rushed. God isn't rushed. God is sometimes patient way beyond the way that we, even in our human justice systems, would choose to be patient. Why? Because he, he's going to act not according to um, the way we, we do on Twitter or online when we immediately cancel somebody, when we write them off. He's going to actually enact 
true justice. And so the question is, can we trust him with that? There's a lot more that could be said about the details of these, these wars. I really recommend the book for you, um, Is God a Moral Monster by Paul Copan, who actually goes into a lot of really important details about difficult questions like why warfare in the Old Testament? You know, why, uh, why, why do we have texts about slavery? What about the ways that women are treated? All these really important questions. It's a fantastic book. So please do read it. But the ultimate thing I want to say is this, that that, that we see the true heart of God. We, you know, we see the old, uh, in the Old and New Testament, justice and love running right through, but it all culminates at the cross. And that's where we see the true heart of, of who God really is. When we see justice and love coming together, when we see God saying, I'm not going to sweep it under the carpet. Uh, you know, the cross is the strongest statement he could make about it, it not being okay for the ways that we wrong and harm each other. And yet at the same time, we also see the mercy of God, the God who hold off judgment for 400 years, the God who who is it, it says in the Old Testament, do I take, the pleasure in the death of the wicked. No, I long for people to turn and be saved. The God, a God whose heart is always towards giving people a chance to repent. A God who chases after us. You know, the prodigal son, he sees him when he's far off and he's messed up and, and he goes running after him. That is the true heart of God. That's what we see in Jesus. The God who he came down in the incarnation to run after us out of love because he is so for us. So God upholds justice at the cross. He says, it's not okay, I'm going to judge it. But then he also says, but I will serve the sentence myself. I will put that on myself because I don't want you to pay what would actually be owed for the ways that all of us have wronged and abused and harmed each other. And so Jesus says, I will serve the sentence. I will take your punishment. And, and all you have to do is say, I don't want to be this way anymore. God, change my life and he will give you freedom. He will literally make you a new creation. So you're not even that person in a meaningful way anymore. You, you're made new. You're a new creation. Um, you, your heart is transformed. And so that that is really the heart of God. That's, that's where the whole Bible culminates. I think when it comes to the Bible, we need to understand that the story and the thread, the arc of what God is doing, there's a reason it's called a salvation history, because the story of the Bible is God's pursuit of people constantly coming closer to bring his salvation. Sometimes it's in difficult, gritty circumstances where people are behaving in appalling ways and justice has to be enacted with immediacy. But God's heart is always towards forgiveness, towards a second chance towards repentance and that is the message of the gospel and that's what's offered to everyone here this evening so keep digging into it don't run away from those hard texts I was tempted for a while but you know the more I dig in the very texts that sometimes I think are going to be the worst and are going to put me off the character of God have come to be the ones I actually find the most amazing because far from God being worse than I thought he actually shows himself to be more loving more good than I could ever have possibly imagined so don't be afraid of the hard parts of the Bible dig in ask God to help you to understand ask other Christians to help you understand read it in community but I think you'll find that actually far from being a God who is evil he is a good loving God a God who sees you a God who sees every person who's committed to justice and committed to love and that's a God that actually you can trust Joe, thank you so much. The depth and the breadth that you covered and the heart that you pour into these honest and amazing answers just means so much to all of us. I don't know if you can see, but in the chat, students have been uh, putting in all night. Like, thank you for your honesty, Joe. Thank you for your transparency. And it really is such a gift. So it's it's been such a treat to get to hear from you. You're right, that last question on the one hand seems so unfair. You had to like take us through the whole journey of the Bible. <laughs> And yet, such an incredible place for us to end tonight. We, we're done Q&A, but we are not done for the whole night. So stay with us. It's another couple moments. But Joe, thank you so much. And uh, from all of us, just the, the warmest thank you. Thank you, guys. It's been a joy to be with you this evening. Well, guys, as Joe signs off, we still have a few announcements. So don't go. We're going to be done in like two seconds. Okay, that's maybe two minutes. Um, here's a few things. Uh, we want to connect with you. So connect with the RZAM Canada team on social media. We would be just absolutely thrilled to connect with you there. So I think there's a slide that's coming up. We would love to connect with you. You can see we're on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook at RZAM Canada, okay? Second, Joe, phenomenal speaker, and she would love to connect with you. You can connect with her on Instagram. You can see her Insta right there. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Would love to connect with you myself as well and be able to discuss this stuff more with you. So please follow us, we'll follow back in the next 24 hours. Uh, there's still more slides. Um, tonight you've heard our answers and it's, a, it's an absolute honor to get to do our best to wrestle through answers with you, but we'd love to hear your thoughts, your answers. So join us at the RZAM online community called RZAM Connect. 
It's free. And this is where you're able to wrestle through these contributing your questions and answers at RZM Connect. So Google that. Uh, next, you all get YouTube uh, advertisement for master classes, master classes for architecture, master class for how to create your own master film if you have a million dollars, a master class on master classes. Well, we have basically a master class on apologetics and evangelism. We'd love for you to join. Um, we want everyone to join regardless of the cost. And so we're giving 20% off for reboot students. So we'd love to have you sign up. This is the RZM Online Academy that Ravi launched a few years ago. We want to see you there. Um, guys, if you need prayer, we're already praying for you and we'd love to pray for you specifically. So please email us at prayer at rzm.ca. I know you're all just like, can't we just slide into the DMs? Guys, if you want to us to pray for you uh, by name for specific stuff, we'd love to, uh, get to have received your prayer request out for rzam.ca. You know the reboot series continues this next Tuesday with Logan Gates on Freedom, and then the following Friday, July 3rd, we're gonna be taking some of your questions from tonight and then more live questions on the night of there. So please invite your friends, invite your relatives, invite your next door neighbors you haven't seen in months because of COVID. We'd love to have all of your questions there. Guys, we have the coronavirus series that starts last Thursday and continues this Thursday. Thursday, Joe Vitelli, you heard from tonight, Dr. Joe Vitelli and her husband, Dr. Vince Vitelli, my boss's boss, they'll both be there, such a power couple, and they're gonna be speaking to us, a love at arm's length, talking to us about social distancing, teaching us about relationships, just incredible stuff. Be there, invite your friends, invite your mom, invite your dad, invite everybody. Um, and then finally, um, yeah, we just wanna say a massive thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, we've been looking at, does God even care about my suffering? And next week we're gonna be looking at, is God against my freedom? One of my best friends here in Toronto, my colleague Logan Gates, is going to be giving that talk, and I don't want you to miss it. So join me there. Guys, we're praying for you. We love you so much. We thank you for staying with us for just about a full 90 minutes. We're like 30 minutes over time. We love you, and have a great night.